This is a production of Cornell University. All right, listen, we got a lot to do in 30 minutes and so nice to have everybody back, whether you're watching this live and, and ready to think about the questions you want to ask or, or uh, so I think Carl, we're also going to take questions. We can start out next week with questions as well, but I, I want to get right to it. Um, uh, Art and I and a lot of people have been chatting for 20 some odd years in the morning and we're uh, started this thing a few, uh, last year uh, during the pandemic when, you know, it was a scary time for everybody. We just, I felt like, I think I was so anxious. I felt like I needed to do something to feel like I was contributing. And uh, Carl and I, and listen, I, it's not I, it's Carl and I and everybody on the team. And here's Art today, a year later, still trying to do the same thing. So uh, this is the minute, right? Uh, you know, it's cute pictures with Frank. So, so um, I just love... Uh, the social media that this sort of stuff when golf course superintendents and people work on golf courses or grounds crews, you know, get their kids out there, expose them to their part of their lives that matters to them a lot and, and exposing them to the natural world. And, you know, there's just, there's just something about working in this field that uh, allows us to share it with uh, many of our loved ones. And, and I just love when we do that. And so Carl, with that, I'm going to pass it back to you for another part of the show this year, where we're going to talk about this very exciting research project we're working on with partnership uh, uh, with the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute at the Galisano Sustainability Center for Sustainability at RIT, and all of it's funded by the Department of Environmental Conservation. So why don't you take a minute and take us through, tell me when you want me to shift the slides, hit next, and I'll take care of it for you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Frank. You know, we're really excited about this project. Uh, we, we call it an environmental results program, and the folks at RIT are uh, very ex experienced at, at doing these sorts of things. And essentially what it is, is, is we're going to try and figure out what BMP adoption is like in our region. So we're kind of focusing on, on Western and Central New York uh, as a region for this specific um, program. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out, okay, what, what is BMP adoption like currently? Uh, and then can we change that? Can we do outreach and education to shift that? And then we're going to go back in and, and do some more random surveying and see, you know, did it work? And, and a lot of this builds, as you know, Frank, um, on the, the BMPs by the GCSAA, the 50 by 2020, we've got all the, I believe all 50 states had codified BMPs uh, by this January, I think it was January 2021. That was a big accomplishment, uh, you know, really exciting to see. Uh, accessible BMP resources for everybody online. But, you know, as we know, that's not really the last step, right? The last step is getting everybody to, to do those best management practices. So we spent last year with our folks at P2I and also Rick Slattery, a, a former superintendent who is extremely valuable to the project as a practical mind, right? You and I, Frank, uh, you know, at a university, you know, we, we don't necessarily have um, all the inner workings of our superintendent figured out. So Rick has been super helpful um, and getting all that survey, survey data last year, looked at the data and said, okay, we got to program some outreach and education. That's where we are now, step two. So in the region, we'll be doing a lot of field days. We'll be doing these webinars, little segments, BMP tip of the day. That's what we'll be doing every week. Um, but it's going to come from, from this poster. So if everybody can see this, it's an info, we call an infographic poster. Um, we have some golf themes in there, right? Par, birdie, eagle. And these are all best practices that we thought up. And we tried to categorize them, of course, in, in categories, water, nutrient management, pests and pollution, and kind of things that are pars. We, we'd like everybody, you know, in a perfect world, I think everybody could do that pretty easily. Uh, birdies maybe cost a little bit more money, maybe some time, maybe they're harder to do. Uh, and then eagles is kind of something you should strive towards. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in the chat link. Uh, everybody can go. You can go download this if you want to print it out. That's great. Um, we're going to be sending this physically to all the golf courses in our little region, central and western New York, as part of the project. Um, but we're really excited about this, Frank. I know it's just kind of a pretty picture, but creating awareness about best practices is what this poster is all about. Um, so we hope, uh, you know, in future webinar episodes, we'll be taking a little part of this every week, expanding it out and, and making that a BMP to the, the day. So just wanted to share that project we're doing regionally um, with everybody here on the webinar podcasts. And so, and Carl, and, and we'll be looking forward to the, um, the BMP tips each week uh, for a minute or two here uh, in the beginning, highlighting some of these things. And just, you know, again, 
Carl glosses over this a little bit, but some of his uh, thinking as an engineer, uh, some of his thinking as a golfer, and also some of his thinking not necessarily being indoctrinated as a, a turf grass professional from his early years, like many of us uh, in this business. You know, he brought to uh, everybody's attention, you know, best is, 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 is a reach for some people. And sometimes, you know, good, maybe we need a good, better, best approach to do it. And so uh, what we've done brilliantly with our partners and with Rick, uh, you know, as have, have sort of Brit tried to make it look nice, look, look like something you'd put up in your shop and start to create a culture around these sorts of things that are really simple, basic stuff. You know, we didn't touch everything with BMPs. We just touched a few of them in this case, just to create a culture that um, ultimately is aligned with the regulatory and the policy people moving forward. So big thanks to Carl. And let me keep moving on here. And so last year, I'm going to go through a little bit of the season last year. And then Art's going to tell us a little bit about what the winter was like. I'll probably bug him about, you know, what we're anticipating after the winter. But certainly when we got back to work, uh, in the spring after the shutdown, everybody needed best practices just to be safe. Now, looking at the weather uh, in the ranking ways that I like to do it, the early, uh, the entire season, uh, the entire calendar year was among the warmest uh, we've ever had in the history of weather record keeping, certainly uh, top 5%. Um, and the rainfall, as you can see in general for us, looked normal. But I think when you look at that teal color, that cuts across New Jersey. Our brother from another mother, Rich Buckley, uh, told us he lived in a monsoon uh, most of the year last year. So we had very distinct gradients in moisture last year across the Northeast. But what was pretty, what got everybody nervous, I think, when we shut down last year was that, man, spring was coming on like a rampage. We were 20 days ahead of normal. It was a warmer winter last year. We were coming off a warmer winter, uh, almost snowless winter, honestly, uh, and, and everything was blooming. And then, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, yes, golf, no golf. And then all of a sudden, things shut down for much of the spring. Uh, we did not have good weather in April and May. The conditions pretty much stayed there and stayed flat in the early part of the season. Were we going to play golf? Weren't we going to play golf? And when you look at actual playing data from the National Golf Foundation, and you look at the shutdown here uh, in, the, in the game of golf and its impact on rounds of golf, you see how dramatic it hit this business. But then, because we were one of the few things you could continue to do, we've seen, look at these year-over-year -year increases here, between 20% and 32% year over year on a month by month basis. And there doesn't appear to be any dropping. I'm, I'm actually currently out in Arizona uh, visiting some research out here. And I can tell you the parking lots are full to the brim because golf is one of the things that is able to be done uh, relatively safely in the current conditions. And so what's interesting as we have a weather guy here, um, we work with a golf uh, economy group uh, Pellucid and, and Stuart Lindsay with Edge Hill Consulting. These guys are business economists, data people that try to figure out what the capacity is to play golf through a golf course. And, and um, you know, they look at something like playable hours that obviously is impacted by day length, but is also impacted by temperature and moisture and, you know, time of year, that sort of thing. And they come up with these playable hour measures. And over the course of the year, you know, we didn't really have very good weather uh, through much of the North uh, for playing golf, at least by these playable hours, right? So it didn't look like, well, weather was kind of normal. November looked good. And if you played golf in warm places, January to March was pretty good. And, and you know, how much you actually utilize those times was more important, right? Rate based on the number of rounds you could put through that were already reduced because you had to space out tee times, how much of that available tee time space did you use? And you used a heck of a lot more than you've ever used in the past. In fact, everybody's basically saying the pandemic did what 15 years of grow the game of golf things couldn't do. So the summer was warm, among the warmest ever in our region in the Northeast. 
It also brought continued rainfall through Jersey and into central New York, but you start to see some drought starting to form here along New England. And then again, through the fall period, again, a very warm fall and a fairly dry fall, dry to the point where we had drought conditions uh, being indicated. Uh, it, by this map, you had pretty severe drought heading into the winter. Our, and of course, the big story in the winter were all of our brothers and sisters across the country that were covered in snow uh, for a period of time. Uh, this is uh, really unbelievable when you consider the landmass covered in snow here, Art. And I'll just wrap it up here and, and ask you to talk a little bit about what the winter was like. But I came across this slide of um, average days per year with an inch of snow depth. And I see where we are, where we're between 75 to 100. And honestly, Art, I was trying to find out what the date of this map was. I can't remember the last time we had 75 days of an inch snow coverage while I've been living in upstate New York for the last close to 30 years now. And of course, for us, with snowfall persistence determines, especially in the Adirondacks and the northern parts of the region, the longer the snow cover, the more you're going to get gray snow mold, which you see in the background here, a lot of gray snow mold. And, and the wet, cool, wet conditions that might persist over the next few weeks, you'll see pink snow mold with the pink around it. So Art, I'll stop sharing and, and just ask you to talk a little bit if, about, uh, it may, you feel free to color in the lines with what I just ranted about, but also if you want to talk to us about the winter, uh, that's a great place to start. It's all yours, pal. Yeah, why don't, why don't we chat about the winter a little bit, Frank? And, and I have to admit, after whatever it is, 25 years, uh, I'm turning you into a weatherman. I, I really yeah. like to see it. Man. Lots of good graphics. You have. I am I am 100% R.D. Gaetano weather protege. I, I have, uh, yeah, thanks for that. I'm there you go. And I know, Carl, do you, see the, do you see the results of the poll? I was interested in those before I kind of went into my spiel. I wondered what people said, so... I, Yep, there was, um, so basically we had about 75% of people thought it was about normal for the winter. Um, and then the other 25% said it was warmer than normal. So no one said colder than normal, uh, which is interesting. I love playing this game all the time. I look back yeah. at monthly data. I try and guess, and I'm not, I'm not too often right. So uh, maybe that can frame our conversation here. Yeah, I, I guess I shouldn't have doubted you guys because I, I figured folks were going to say it was colder than normal because of short term memory and February was colder than normal. But pretty much when we looked at the winter, it was definitely on the warm side of normal. Um, um, I would call it an above normal winter. Uh, it wasn't, you know, Frank likes his rankings. It really wasn't top 10. You had to pretty much go to northern New England, like northern Maine, to find something that had their top 10 warmest winter. Um, in terms of precipitation, I think precipitation was kind of the main story uh, of the winter in, in kind of two ways. If we look at like when we melt all the snow, how much liquid we actually got. Um, there, January was very, very, very dry. And then kind of it was bracketed by, by wetter periods, both in December and, and also this past month in, in uh, February. And Really, again, um, that kind of bimodal, you know, what Frank kind of hit on it over the growing season where New Jersey was really, really wet. And when you got north of New York City, uh, they had dry conditions, particularly in New England. And that's starting to rear its ugly head again. I don't think I ever remember folks in March starting to talk about drought, but they definitely are in Massachusetts and Connecticut. We've just done some drought calls with folks up there. And they're really concerned with actually in that area, a lack of snowpack and the dry conditions over the winter really starting. Groundwater hasn't responded. Um, the streams that are flowing haven't responded. So they're really starting to get their, their, you know, their alerts up for what might happen coming into the spring. Um, I think snowfall was the big uh, issue. You know, if we wanted to go top 10, snowfall was the big one. And there again, it really depended on where you are. You know, there was kind of a bullseye of heavy snow from pretty much eastern Pennsylvania, kind of skirted New York City, got the, the southern part of New England, and then back up into kind of our neck of the woods. Um, you know, Binghamton had their snowiest winter ever on record. In many places in that swath from probably about Allentown, Pennsylvania, um, you know, up through maybe Hartford and Connecticut were were in, in the top 10 in terms of snowiest. 
And really that came in two big dumpings. There was that big before Christmas dumping that, um, you know, or, or around Christmas dumping. And then, and then one just this, this last month. Um, what else, um, Frank, I guess Frank, you know, Frank touched on that snow cover. I agree, Frank, that seems uh, pretty, pretty high to me for, for up here having 75 days in the winter that have snow cover. I mean, you think about it, that's only, that's almost two and a half months. And yeah, I don't remember that in, in my recollection of, of being up here. And even, even this winter being a skier, you know, and having lots of snow, I don't think we, I don't think we came close to that. I, I mean, I'm, I didn't look at the data for that, but if I had to guess, maybe I put it at, at 50 at best. And that would be for the far North as well. I mean, how different is, I, I think we got old Walt, Walt Nelson on with us too. And so, um, you know, how would Walt be uh, up there? Is the persistence any better at the higher elevations? I think the ski hills have done fairly good this year, haven't they? Yeah, I think the northern areas didn't do that well in terms of snowfall, right? They were, the, the Tug Hill and things like that were below normal, actually, last I looked for the winter. But, you know, then again, below normal from the, for them still might be 150 inches of snow. Um, they might have done pretty good in terms of their persistence because they did get it early on. And then, and then um, you know, they're obviously still have it now. So one of the things that comes up is we, you know, to me is the toughest part of, the, of climate change in general and the weather we're seeing continue to transition is the transitions or are the transitions between the seasons, uh, you know, the, the, and winter into spring, I, I honestly is the pay, biggest pain in the ass. It has to do with the startup of everything and the way pests and growth and traffic and everything gets going. Um, and, I mean, obviously it has implications if you're in the fruit tree business, you know, the, 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 the fall springs and the implications of those kinds of things. Are we getting any smarter about understanding uh, how the weather behaves in these transitions or is the volatility that we experience, are gonna experience for the next couple of months uh, pretty, pretty what we're gonna have to deal with now with climate change? Yeah, I think the transition seasons are always going to be tough. I mean, this one gives us, a, you know, this current transition season gives us a little bit to go on. Um, there are La Nina conditions for this winter. And if there's any type of a, um, any type of a, a, a relationship between that and our weather, it, it tends to rear itself kind of at this time of year. We typically see, you know, the, the cold February was uh, a pretty classic signature of that. Um, despite the temperatures we're seeing right now, I think the longer range outlook for the rest of March actually has it turning on the colder side again. So, I um, mean, yeah, I think enjoy what we're going to see the next couple of days because, um, you know, it looks like at least the looking out for the next couple of weeks will be on the on the colder side through March. Mm. That's, this is well, OK, so I, I, I'll say it's a bit the nightmare scenario because of the following. One is golf is one of the few things you can do. We'll talk to our sports turf brothers and sisters tomorrow about the plowing off fields to play on them and the implications of that. But this warm snap that we're having uh, is going to get everybody out itching, absolutely itching to, to skin it off. I did a webinar with the Connecticut guys today, and they're all itching to get out and do it which means they're going to prep the place and then it's going to turn cold, which means the grass is not going to grow so much. And it's going to have all those people that want to get out there and start to play. And what I want to talk to you about art is soils and how the frost went into the ground and is slowly coming out of the ground and the implications of that in your experience for plant growth. You know, one of the things I've always loved about you is you're actually a plant guy who decided to study weather. And, and, and turned out to be a data weather guy as much as a natural world person in general. So what about how this frost goes in and comes out of the ground and the implications from your experience with rooting anyway? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think this winter is a good example of, I don't, you know, despite, you know, February being cold and things like that, we had a heck of a snowpack. So I don't think this frost really got into the soil in, in very many places at all this winter. So I think the soil did not freeze very deeply at all this winter um you know coming out of it now soils are soils are wet and as we move into this period of time 
you know, it's even though they're not frozen, I think they're going to be, you know, they're going to stay cool for a while with them being wet and the weather pattern I see coming up for the next month. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't I, I don't see things uh, happening very quickly uh, through the next month in terms of, of seeing things green up and things like that. The one exception might be in the places that tended to be drier through the winter. So maybe kind of the Boston area, uh, eastern Massachusetts, and then as you move down, maybe southern Jersey into Connecticut, where they did not get as much rain uh, this winter as other places. So they might warm up quicker and 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 you'll get you'll get activity. So one of the things I talk a lot about, uh, and I, you know, obviously you're talking about a situation where this might make sense. We have the ability to pigment the surface, uh, put dark sand on the surface, uh, do things to try to elevate surface temperatures to get things growing. And I've always been interested. Do you, do you have any experience with uh, darkening the surface, uh, you know, look and looking at how deep, that temperature will penetrate over time. We use covers a lot, art in in our in golf as well, and and you know you use it to trap the heat in. I always think trap the heat in at during the day, but hold it in uh, at night. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about if we get some sun, and it's cool temperatures, but it's sunny. If my surface is dark, I'm wondering if I can goose the soil temperature a little bit with that sort of strategy. What yeah, that's going to make the world a difference, Frank. It really will. I mean, anything you can do to darken that, increase the amount of solar radiation from the sun that's absorbed, um, you know, you're going to you're going to help it out quite a bit. I mean, just you know, all you have to do is is you know, it's the same principle. Think of a driveway on a hot summer day. You don't want to be walking barefoot on it, and and you know, same thing as you go to spring. The sun's getting higher in the sky. Uh, that, that's going to work quite nicely. Okay, Carl, do we have any questions or do you have a question from Art uh, or for Art? Otherwise, I, I have a, a couple more. I'm wondering if anybody has any questions or what was the answer to the poll? Yeah, yeah no questions. Um, but the poll is, is, you know, I think everybody got it about right. I'm surprised no one said colder than normal. I would have said colder than normal again because of my bias. I'm, I'm just waiting to go out and play golf. I'm cooped up and uh, I would have said colder than normal, but everybody else a little better perspective there. Uh, no right. questions, but Frank, I think maybe a question for you. You know, we talked about uh, snow cover persistence and how this year was a lot longer than, you know, we have, have seen in the past. What are the repercussions from that uh, in, in our region? You know, disease wise, uh, I think snow mold is what I'm trying to get at. You know, what do you think we'll see coming out here in the spring? So um, I don't think there's, you know, Art, I'm gonna pass, I'm gonna ask you first. Do you look at snow length cover? Uh, do we have data that indicates snow length cover? Oh, we definitely do. Um, I'll have to admit, I don't know that off the top of my head here for the for for this, but no, 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 uh, that data clearly exists. Okay, because because it's really it, you know anytime you get north of thirty days, you get into gray snow mold territory. Now, this is the interesting thing, and it's another thing for you, Art. You know, snow isn't like Utah snow uh, in the Northeast. It might be Utah snow for like a week, and then it melts and freezes and melts and freezes and melts and freezes. Um, that's obviously not as good of an insulation, I wouldn't think, uh, as a fluffy thing. But do we differentiate uh, the snowpack as it melts and freezes? Um, no, there's no no distinction on that. It's basically a yes or no type thing. Is there is there snow on the ground or not? And I guess I learned something today. I didn't know that magic thirty day type mm -hmm. number for for snow mold. Mm -hmm. um, but but thinking back on the winter and 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 where the highest snowfall totals were, I would say that a good area, pretty much north of central New Jersey, um, saw thir at least thirty days of snow cover this okay. year. So, you know. Places in and around New Jersey uh, might be those ones where the snow cover was particularly persistent. I know I yeah. talked to my folks in New Brunswick yesterday, and they said, you know, even though it was seventy, they still had snow on the snow yeah. on the ground. Yeah. Okay. So, so there is the answer to the question, Carl. Whenever you get persistent snow cover, you probably get some gray snow mold. Now, as you go north to where Paul Cope does the samples up in Marquette, Michigan, and Wisconsin, way northern Wisconsin. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't know if Marv Seaman, Seaman does them up in the Adirondacks, but certainly the, you know, the Canadians are ex experts at this. 
long snow cover means uh, gray snow mold that can take off some of the leaf tissue and get itself into the crown. In general, even with you know 30 days, you'll get a little bit. It'll probably grow out of it, but it'll take a little while. And I think Art's point about how things are going to be slow moving forward is an indication of the kind of recovery you're going to get. Right now, great uh, pink snow mold again. If Art's predictions hold true, uh, where you get this cooler, I don't know, wetter period. Art, are we going to be wet or are we going to be dry over the? I next don't see period? nothing. Yeah, I, I don't see much to indicate one way or the other there in terms of wetness or dryness coming up over the next couple of weeks. Okay, so so whenever we get into persistently cool weather, Carl, especially especially we start you know goosing the growth and getting it green and getting it darker, getting it moving. It's going to be more lush, and then you get those you know crappy cool weather conditions, and it's just a bad situation for things like pink snow mold. So you know. There's a lot of things you can do. And oddly enough, to be honest, take my non-chemical hat on for a second. If you got good sandy soils on your greens, uh, rolling will do a pretty good job on pink snow mold uh, based on the stuff that Clint Maddox has done out in the Pacific Northwest. I wouldn't have any reservations. If your soils aren't wet uh, and you got sand greens that should be draining, as long as they're draining, you're home free. What you're going to want to be careful about, again, especially what Art's saying, is, is if you're not getting the growth yet, uh, you know, your traffic, uh, you know, while I'm on this call, this is hysterical. While I'm doing this with you guys, a text comes across my computer. It's the Cornell soccer coach asking if he can use the playing fields tomorrow. <laughs> so here we go. I mean, I don't think there's going to be a person in our business that isn't going to have issues with people wanting to be outside on their surfaces. And I, for one, am glad we have that problem. And Art, I, for one, am glad I've had 20 years of talking to you to turn me into a weather person. Carl, as we wrap up here at 8.30, uh, I want to pass it to you. I'll thank Art for joining us, all of you for taking the time to be with us. And for those maybe listening, feel free to submit your questions. Uh, we'll take them and maybe tackle them a little bit over the course of the time we do this um, and also helps us inform the things we're trying to do education wise and stay tuned for more BMP stuff. All right, Carl, it's all yours. Yep. Thanks, Frank. Uh, thanks, Art, again today. for, no for problem. Thanks, with Carl us. and Frank. Thanks for the invite. Yep. Uh, so for everyone, we're going to be doing this every week. Uh, Rich, I see a question about some weed stuff. Uh, next week, we got Rich Buckley on. So, you know, if you got any questions that maybe don't fit into this week, I'll catalog those and, and maybe we'll address those with future guests. So, um, you know, for Frank, for Art, uh, it's been Carl. Thanks for the Cornell Turf Show. Fastest 30 minutes in turf. We hit it right on the nail, 10.30 a.m. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.